Thank you very much for joining the first of the Dementia Researcher webinars. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Marianne Coleman, who's joining us today. And Hello. she's uh, going to be talking about her work um, and over a two part special, but today we're going to be focusing on uh, what happens to your eyes when you get older. So uh, thank you very much everyone for joining us. This talk will be around 20 minutes and then we've allowed 10 minutes at the end for questions. So um, if at any point you uh, think of a question, um, if you would like to just um, add that to the bottom using the Q&A link, which I hopefully you can see. Uh, and then what will happen is when Mariana's finished in 20 minutes time, I will uh, come to those questions and read them out for, for Marianne to, to answer. If you haven't already uh, registered, uh, Marianne will be back with us at 12 o'clock tomorrow uh, to present the second part of this uh, webinar. Indeed. Where, where tomorrow she will uh, focus on her own research uh, into dementia and, and eye care. So thank you very much. Um, I'm not gonna keep rambling on, so we'll let Marianne get on. Thank you very much. And um, Marianne, if you'd like to share your screen now. Thank you. Fantastic. Right. Hello, everybody. From whatever time zone you're tuning in from, um, it's a real pleasure to be able to present this to you today. Um, so what I'm starting with is essentially kind of the background to the research that I've done. So um, this is basically looking at what happens to your eyes as you get older. It's very much a whistle stop tour and it's aimed at people that don't have any background in uh, knowledge about eyes or eyesight or um, dementia research as a whole. Um, very much aimed at a public audience. If you have any questions, happy to take those as we go. Um, so why am I giving this talk? Well, I'm an eye care professional by background. Um, I'm an orthoptist, which basically means straight eyes. So my profession is the one that you've never heard of until you actually need us. Um, we diagnose and treat problems with moving the eyes around and using them together as a pair. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So this talk is basically aimed at giving a brief overview of what happens to your eyes as you get older and how these changes can relate can lead to some of the common age related eye diseases, which I'm sure many of you will have already heard of. Um, but also importantly, giving some tips on how to look after your eyes as you get older as well. So. In order to work out what happens to your eyes as you get older, it's first important to know about what's in the eyeball and how it helps you see. So I thought I would start off with a quick tour of the eyeball and all the bits in it and what they do. So we start off with the iris first at the front of the eye. So this is the coloured part of the front of the eye that you see in most photographs of people. Um, why we have different eye colours like green, blue, brown, etc. But its main purpose in how we see is to block light from coming into the eye. Now this might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but you'll see a bit more about why that's important later on. So the iris's purpose is to control the amount of light that enters the eye. So when the pupil, which is the black part in the centre of the eye, surrounded by the iris, lets in the light, the light then passes through the lens, which then bends the light to focus it in a nice pinpoint shape on the back of the retina. So at the back of the eye, we have the retina, which converts light into signals that can be interpreted by the brain. So basically, the entire eye is geared up to ensure that light can then enter the eye, come out the back through the pupil, through the lens, and focus on the macula. So the macula is the part of the back of the eye that is specialized for detail and color vision, our reading, ability to watch TV, recognize faces, all of these things we are dependent on, the light hitting the macula in a nice pinpoint way to produce a sharp and clear image that can then be converted into signals that are interpreted by the brain to produce the visual image. So everything inside the eye is geared up to put that nice pinpoint image onto the macula. So all of these structures inside the eye that I've just talked about can be affected by the aging process. And what we're gonna do now is talk about each of these structures in turn and how it has a knock-on effect on how you see as you get older. So what we're gonna do is start off first with the pupil. So as I mentioned before, the point of the pupil is to let in light. And this, the amount of light that gets let in is controlled by the iris. So the iris, has two sets of muscles which are in a constant tug of war with each other that determine how big your pupil is and how much light can enter the eye. So when there's a lot of light you don't want too much of it getting into the eye because it can cause a lot of dazzle and you think oh it's really bright out there. So what happens is your pupils will get smaller 
um, and that's because of the muscles in the iris resulting in that pupil reducing in size. So as I mentioned before, these muscles are in a constant tug of war with each other. One set make the pupil smaller and one set make the pupil bigger and that controls how much light enters the eye. However, one of these sets of muscles gets weaker with age faster than the other and so you end up with the other set winning this tug of war as you get older and it's the muscles that make the pupil bigger that start to weaken with age. So this means that your pupil gets smaller as you get older. So that means there's less light coming into the eye. So that's the knock-on effect. As you get older, the muscles in your iris get a bit weaker, and as a result, you end up with a smaller pupil. So how does this affect how you see? So when you are looking at a book, you have the light bouncing off the page and coming into the eye. If you have lots of light bouncing off the page and coming into the eye, then you end up with what we call better contrast. So this is our ability to see when the lighting's not very good, okay? So if you have a better contrast, it's because of more light entering the eye. Now, if you have a pupil that's smaller as a result of getting older and you have less light coming into the eye as a result, you end up with a more murky picture with less light coming in. You're not as able to make out the details of the white background and the black text against it. Everything starts to come together in a bit more of a murky gray. So contrast vision is very important to us as we get older. It's very important for navigation, um, for being able to read and all of these sorts of things. And this is why as we get older, we need more light to read by. So this can also have an impact in falls as well. If you have poor contrast vision, it can affect your ability to walk around and to detect obstacles as effectively if the lighting in your house is not very good. So overall, the age-related changes in the eye that affect our contrast vision can actually increase our risk of falling. So that's why these things are important. So moving on to the lens, which is the next part of our eyeball tour. So the lens can be affected in a couple of different ways as you get older. But one of the most common ones, which we will all experience at some point or another in our lives, is the change to our ability to focus. So the way in which the lens works inside the eye is to bend the light to get the light into a pinpoint shape on the macula for detailed vision like reading. So for reading, this is very much a near activity. We hold our book up here so that we can read it properly. But the, the knock on effect of that is that the lens needs to bend the light more as it enters the eye in order to get it still into that pinpoint section on the back of the eye for the detailed view of the text. So basically our lens inside the eye changes shape to bend the light more or less depending on how far away or how near our object of interest is. So as we get older, the lens becomes harder and stiffer, it becomes less malleable. And this means that it can't bend the light quite so much. As I mentioned before, if you're reading a book and you're holding it up, you know, at a normal reading distance, um, you need to have the lens inside your eye change shape to become thicker to bend the light more. If it can't do that, then you can't hold your book as close anymore in order to get a clear picture. And this is why, as time goes on, our arms get too short. So as we get older, we all eventually need some kind of either pair of reading glasses or an adaptation to our existing reading prescription um, in order to be able to see our books properly. Otherwise, we have to just hold them further and further away to accommodate the fact that the lens is no longer able to change shape as easily as it used to. And it's therefore it ends up getting stuck in a kind of distance viewing configuration. And so reading glasses can help to make up the difference and bend the light more to get it into a pinpoint position on the back of the eye so that we can actually see the text properly. So this is very common, as I mentioned to before. Um, it's one of the most inconvenient aspects of aging as anybody who's had to juggle multiple pairs of reading glasses and distance glasses and all of that sort of thing will be able to tell you. Um, but it is something that happens to us all. Um, one of the other things that happens to the lens as we get older is to do with the proteins inside the lens, which keep it nice and clear and keep it nourished so that it can bend the light that passes through the eye. And this is what causes cataract, because as time goes on, these lens proteins start to degrade, which can cause a clouding and yellowing of the lens. So most of the people watching this webinar will have known at least one person that's had a cataract operation. It's the most common eye operation in older people. It has a massive impact on sight um, because of the impact that the cataract has on the passage of light through the eye. Okay, So if you have a cataract that is causing a cloudy yellow lens, it increases the scatter of the light. 
so that there is less light getting to where it needs to be, which causes a blurred image. And it can also affect your contrast vision. As I mentioned before, if you have less light that is effectively passing through the eye, it can affect your ability to see when the lighting's not very good. So all of these things can be affected and uh, probably the best example of the impact of cataract on vision comes from the art of Monet, uh, who developed quite uh, dense cataracts over time. So you can see before the cataracts developed, his favourite bridge that he loved to paint was, uh, uh, was nice and clear. But then after the cataracts developed, you just get this muddy, murky mess. Um, it was when, uh, the autumn when he painted this next view of the bridge. Um, but this was basically what his vision was like until um, the cataracts were extracted in the 1920s. Um, and so you can see the profound impact that cataract can have on eyesight and why the cataract operation to remove them makes such a difference to people's eyesight. So with regard to cataracts, there are lots of different factors that can affect the development of cataracts. Some people can end up being quite advanced in age before cataracts develop, whereas you may know some people who are in in their late 50s and early 60s that may have had their cataracts removed. There's a couple of different factors that affect that. So things that increase the risk of developing cataracts, actually sunlight exposure is one of the key factors. So um, Fight for Sight, which is the eye research charity that funded my dementia research, um, they did a study um, and they found that it was about 50-50 as to whether adults across the UK actually wore sunglasses outdoors. Um, so sunglasses can actually be quite a protective effect against the development of cataracts and the reason for that is because of the way that UV light interacts with some of the proteins inside the lens. So buying proper sunglasses that are CE marked and making sure that you wear them regularly when you're outdoors is really important. If they're not CE marked, then you can end up with um, them not being as able to block the different types of UV light as effectively or even at all. So if you bought your sunglasses for about one pound on eBay and they've come from somewhere that doesn't have CE marking, they're probably a bit too good to be true in terms of actually protecting your eyesight. So investing in a good set of properly marked sunglasses is very important to protect your eyesight in a number of different ways. So um, smoking as well can affect your risk of developing cataract. Again, um, it can interact with a number of vascular factors um, and also the lens proteins inside the eye as well. So those are some of the examples of why some people may develop cataracts earlier than others. Fortunately, the operation to extract cataracts is very straightforward, but in the UK, there is currently a major issue to do with the rationing of cataract surgery so that in some instances, you cannot access cataract surgery until your vision is deteriorated quite substantially. And so there are some issues related to that, which can mean that people are actually walking around with uh, relatively limited eyesight um, for prolonged periods of time as they wait for their operation and wait for their vision to actually get bad enough to the point where the NHS thinks it's worth having it done. Um, so there are some issues there um, but some of these factors that affect the risk of developing cataracts like sunlight and smoking can also affect other parts of the eye that are affected in aging as well. So what I'm going to do now is move on to the retina. So this is the most essential part for our vision. Without that layer of light sensitive cells that talks to the brain, we cannot see. So the brain, uh, the retina has a number of different layers, but the main ones that are of interest in how we see are what we call the photoreceptor cells, the rod and cone cells. So these basically take the light and convert them into electrical signals for the brain. Um, and in addition to that, the other thing that's important is the pigment epithelium. So this is how um, the rod and cone cells get their nutrition. Um, what the pigment epithelium also does, which is very important, is tidy up all of the rubbish that the rod and cone cells do, um, produce as part of their natural um, cycle of existence. So um, in the picture, you'll see that there's these little lines um, on, the, uh, on the cells. These are called discs. And these discs get regularly shed and regrown as part of the process of these cells existing. Um, and what the pigment epithelium does is it gobbles up all of this debris um, in order to keep the uh, retina nice and healthy and to keep these cells nourished. So things can go wrong with this process. As you get older, the actual garbage disposal efficiency of the pigment epithelium starts to reduce over time. And this results in a buildup of debris. Now it's the buildup of debris that's the issue here and it's what causes one of the other most common causes of sight loss in older people, age-related macular degeneration. So the way that this happens 
is because the buildup of debris actually affects the way in which those rod and cone cells, which are so important to how we see, actually receive their nutrients and oxygen. Um, because of that, it then starts a process of cell death, um, which can then affect a number of different things. You end up with, um, at the back of the eye, looking something like this picture, where you get loads of these little yellow deposits, which are called exudates. Um, and basically the process is not, it's not good for the retina. So the cells will die um, as a result, of, which is what we call dry AMD, where you get a lot of atrophy of the retina, like they get a lot of cell death and those, those areas are just no longer functioning anymore. They're not, they're not taking that light, they're not converting it into electrical signals and you end up with um, patchy losses of sight across your vision, but particularly in the center in the macula, because obviously the macula is where our detailed vision is, it's where the most concentration of rod and cone cells is, particularly the cone cells, which help us with our colour and detail vision. And so this, this build up of debris and the disruption to the nutrient supply for the cells is most apparent at that location. Um, as well as the cells dying, in response to the oxygen deprivation, the other thing that can happen is loads of tiny little blood vessels can grow and burst. Um, so these cells, are these blood vessels are really fragile. Um, and so they can just they can just burst and become really leaky, um, which can cause a whole load of other knock on effects that are really bad for the back of the eye as well. Um, and effectively, this is what we call wet AMD, which is where you have loads of little hemorrhages at the back of the eye. Um, you may have some members of the family or other people that you know that are receiving injections for their age related macular degeneration. And this is to try and tidy up all of these little blood vessels that grow and burst. Um, so that can have an effect as well. So this is the kind of image that you can have in late stage AMD. So the disease in terms of the impact on your vision, it starts off as just being a minor distortion of your central vision. But as time goes on, you can end up with a complete central visual loss, which um, you can imagine how it would affect ability to recognize faces, how it would affect your ability to read, watch TV, uh, move around, so many different things that can affect it. And so people that are living with late stage AMD, um, they are very reliant on the uh, support services that we have here in the UK in order to keep them independent and still and still living at home um, because the impact on vision is so profound. So um, as I mentioned before, you can potentially try and slow or stop the progression of the wet type of AMD if you can detect it early enough and get those injections into the eye to deal with those blood vessels. But for dry AMD, which is the one that's related to cell death because of the lack of nutrients, um, it progresses more slowly, but there is no current treatment for it. There's lots and lots of amazing research ongoing to look into treatments for dry AMD. But at present, you cannot just walk into the NHS with a case of dry AMD and expect to get a treatment for it, unfortunately. So that's an area of which there is a lot of ongoing research. Um, so that's basically the situation there. In terms of the current lockdown, um, it is strongly encouraged that you continue to go for your wet AMD injections. Um, this is considered an essential treatment because it can cause sight loss if the injections are stopped. Uh, many people have their injections monthly or every couple of months. Um, and so if they stop doing those during the lockdown period, it can obviously cause a major threat to sight. Um, so that's an important piece of information to convey. If you're having injections, make sure you go and keep those up. Um, so there are some other things that can happen um, to your eyes as you get older. Um, one of the things that can happen is dry eye. So you get uh, dry, uncomfortable eyes that are really painful. Um, and this is because tear production is reduced as you get older. And in addition to that, your eyelids, the tissue there becomes less uh, taut. And because of that, it can affect the distribution of tears across the front of the eye when you blink. Um, so that's one of the things that can happen. Um, depth perception, our use, ability to use our eyes together as a pair to judge distances, which is what I research. Um, this can become more of an effort as we get older. Our eyes don't coordinate quite as well as we used to, and we're at greater risk of developing problems with using the eyes together and moving them around. And this results in us seeing two of things, which is obviously very uncomfortable and quite distressing for people and can increase your risk of falling. If you're seeing two of everything all the time, how do you know which step is the real one? Um, so that can sometimes happen and is easily treated by seeing one of our services. Um, glaucoma is another really insidious condition that affects um, 
could predominantly, it can affect people at any age, but as you get older, your risk of developing glaucoma can increase. And the reason for this is because the changes in the lens that I mentioned before can interfere with the circulation of fluid between the front and the back of the eye, which can cause an increase in eye pressure. Um, if that happens, it can then cause greater pressure on all of the cells at the back of the eye within the retina, um, which can again cause further damage to the back of the eye and the ability to see. Um, this results in the opposite of AMD in that you lose your peripheral vision, but your central vision remains largely intact. And this is why, as shown in the picture there, Glaucoma can be a really dangerous condition because it can be completely silent because you are so reliant on your central vision for your day-to-day -day activities like reading, TV, seeing friends and family, all of that kind of thing that you don't notice so much the potential shrinking of your visual world through the loss of your peripheral vision. And so glaucoma um, can be treated very easily if it's detected early. But after a time, the eye pressure becomes so much that the loss of sight that happens cannot be reversed. So that's a very important thing to consider as well. As you get older, the changes in the lens can increase your risk of developing glaucoma. So um, I've talked about quite a few things here. It's not all doom and gloom, I promise. Um, while the existence of these conditions and the changes in your eyes as you get older can make seeing more of an effort, just because these things can happen doesn't necessarily mean that they will. And I'd like to share a couple of big tips on how to look after your eyes as you get older and to make sure that if any of these conditions do start to develop, that they get picked up nice and early for treatment. So one of the biggest things that I can recommend is making sure that you take advantage of your free NHS sight test. So when you are under the age of 70, but you're over the age of 60, you can get a free eye test every two years. If you're over the age of 70, you can have a free eye test every year. And the reason for this is because the risk of developing all of these different age-related eye conditions that I mentioned before, glaucoma, cataract, age-related macular degeneration, the risk of developing all of these things goes up exponentially after the age of 70. So by having a yearly sight test at that point for free, you can keep an eye on your eyesight and ensure these things are picked up early. So the early detection of eye problems is very important and your optometrist can have a look at the back of the eye as part of the sight test. It's not just about keeping an up-to-date pair of specs, it's about making sure that the back of the eye is nice and healthy as well. And if there are any problems, they will be able to see the early signs of these and arrange for you to get treatment. Another thing as well is making sure that you have enough light to read by. I mentioned before that the different age related changes in the eye can affect our contrast vision, our ability to see when the lighting's not very good. So having a good set of powerful wattage light bulbs in your house and a good directional reading lamp can really make a big difference to how well you can see when you're navigating around your home as we are all um, very much staying at home at this present moment in time. Um, it's very important to make sure that you have good light within which to navigate your house to help reduce your risk of falls and make sure you can enjoy your vision to the maximum. In addition to this, you can help to protect your eyes against the development of cataracts by making sure that all of this uh, sunshine that we've been getting intermittently over the last couple of weeks, if you're going out to enjoy it for your state mandated exercise that you've got your sunglasses on, if the UV index is high, which you can check on the weather report, it's especially important because the whole point of wearing the sunglasses is to protect your eyes against UV light, which can increase your risk of developing earlier cataracts. Um, there are also some lifestyle changes that you can do um, if you make sure that um, you've got a good level of diet, um, that you're going outside and getting your dose of vitamin D, that you're staying hydrated as well, because if you have good hydration, it reduces your risk of developing dry eye. And also if you are smoking still, that you do try and give it up because it can cause a number of different issues that are related to the health of the eyes. So these are some examples of all of the different things that you can do to look after your eyes as you get older. If you take nothing else away from this talk, it's to make sure that you keep up to date with your routine free NHS sight test. An important thing to remember is that if you have a diagnosis of dementia, you are entitled to have a sight test at home if you're unable to attend a high street opticians unaccompanied. So that's an important thing to bear in mind as well. So keeping your eyes tested regularly, make sure they're nice and healthy. And then last but not least, I'd like to finish off by just briefly introducing my research, which I'll be talking about in the next webinar, which has been funded by Fight for Sight, which are the eye research charity in the UK. Um, so 
all of these sight problems that I mentioned before can affect people living with dementia, but because of their dementia, they can experience unique difficulties coping with changes in their eyesight associated with both aging and also these age related eye conditions. And my research focuses on the ability to judge distances, which is depth perception. Um, if you have trouble judging distances, it can increase your risk of falling. Um, and there is some anecdotal evidence that dementia can affect your ability to judge distances, but we don't know very much about the best way to measure this in people living with dementia and whether in fact it does get worse as dementia progresses or whether eyesight in general changes as part of the progression of dementia. So my webinar tomorrow will be focusing a bit more on untangling some of these factors and just presenting the findings from the research that I've done. Um, and that's basically everything. So thank you very much for listening. I'd be happy to take questions at this point. I'll have a little look at the Q&A and see what's there. Thank you, Marianne. <clears throat> okay, um, I can see we uh, first of all have a question from Karina Massey. who said hello and thank you for this webinar. We were wondering uh, from the conditions you've spoken about, can any of these be inherited? Um, there are some genetic elements to some of these. Um, but the, um, the understanding of that is a bit more limited at this time. It's not something that I have a specific background in to be able to comment on. Um, but certainly um, for uh, earlier development of cataracts, there can be a degree of a genetic element to that. Um, but there are, it's mainly the lifestyle factors that receive the primary focus. Um, glaucoma, there is a particular family history element to that. If you have uh, immediate family members with glaucoma, you are at increased risk of developing it yourself. Um, so I can't comment specifically on, yes, there's definitely a genetic link for this, and yes, there's that, and so on. But hopefully that gives a, an example of how family history can have an impact for certain types of eye conditions. Um, but age-related macular degeneration in particular is so common um, amongst older people uh, to some degree or another that it's very difficult to actually untangle some of these other, these other contributing factors to it. So, for example, vitamin D is implicated in as a protective factor against age-related macular degeneration, but it's a very difficult phenomenon to study because some studies have found that there is a link and if you get more vitamin D then it can reduce your risk and then other ones haven't found the same level of linkage, so it's a bit difficult to say in some instances. Thank you. Um, I can, don't, so we've got one more question to come in now. Uh, fantastic webinar, this is from James Fletcher. Thank Fantastic webinar, thanks. Does the profession always try to distinguish between aging caused and disease caused degeneration? Okay, so um, the, um, there are not very many researchers in my profession. Um, there is only a limited amount of uh, research that's been carried out specifically looking at um, the relationship between dementia and eyesight. Um, it is a very difficult thing to untangle because of the fact that you have um, these things that happen naturally as part of the aging process of the eye um, and then you have the further deteriorations that can be caused as part of the disease process. Um, most of what we know comes from longitudinal studies and it, indeed the, the link between dementia and eyesight is still a bit it's still a bit this way that way chicken and egg kind of scenario we still don't have a full understanding of it um, so linkages have been suggested and evidenced but in terms of establishing direct causation it's a lot harder to do um, as far as possible in our research we try to control for things like age and stuff like that in our analysis because we know these things do um, increase in likelihood as you get older um, but it is it is definitely a sticky thing to try and untangle i'm not not going to sugarcoat that Thank you very much. Um, uh, we've had another question from here from Kelly Lee. Uh, hello, thank you. This was very interesting and certainly explains why she can't see writing on tins anymore. I think I have that same problem too. Uh, her question is, Is uh, are you aware of people in care homes getting access to eye tests? It, 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 is, it is also occurred to her that uh, lighting is often a problem. People don't always have their glasses or access to uh, outside to gain vitamin D. Yes, um, there was a recent study where they sent a lot of opticians into care homes to do eye tests for people. Um, and uh, they found that for people in institutional care settings, their access to um, eye care and also the prevalence of um, treatable causes of vision impairment like cataract, 
which can be extracted, um, out-of-date glasses, which can be updated and worn, um, all of these things people in care settings were at greater risk of experiencing. And um, do you find that care homes are quite good at being proactive in supporting residents to, to access opticians? Do they kind of do things like arrange for somebody to come and spend uh, a morning there to, to test the eyes of several people or does it, is it down to residents to organise for themselves? Yeah, that's correct. They, um, they usually have what's known as a domiciliary optician coming in to do testing in the care home on a, on a semi-regular basis. However, um, again, this ties into the fact that people living with dementia do experience unique difficulties coping with sight loss and problems with how they're seeing things. Um, if it is down to the resident to request whether or not they want to test or need a test, then there can be issues there um, with access. Thank you. Um, we've had another question from uh, Johnny um, Mijia. Um, I think I've pronounced that right. Um, he says, hi, or she says, hi, thank you for the webinar. Besides the Monet work, have you discovered how people with different uh, diseases see the way that they do? I suppose, has there been any research on, you know, effects on eyesight from people with different diseases? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There is um, a number of different um, uh, neurodegenerative conditions that can have a knock-on effect on eyesight because the brain and the eyes work so closely together in how we see the world. Um, so Parkinson's disease, you can experience problems with coordinating your eyes um, and uh, there are other conditions such as uh, autoimmune diseases like myasthenia gravis which can have profound effects on the eye muscles which can cause variable levels of double vision um, which we can treat. Um, I think the important thing is that um, we do more research to develop a better understanding of how people living with all kinds of long-term conditions can have their eyesight affected by that and to ensure that they have the relevant access to services. I'll talk more about this in tomorrow's webinar. Um, but yes, there has been a lot of work in different areas, but for neurodegenerative diseases and uh, things like brain cancer and so on in particular, um, because of the, the close relationship between the brain and the eyes um, there can be quite profound effects on that. It is interesting and, and I think that occurred to me towards the end there how you can see how somebody who is living with dementia also having to to cope with with the uh, the effects of some of these conditions on their eyes is definitely going to have a massive impact on their ability to stay at home for longer and to continue to engage mm -hmm. with the, the world uh, around them uh, and obviously we have speech and language therapists that look at communication problems and being able to see things is, is going to have a massive impact. So I am really looking forward to your talk tomorrow to find out about your research there. So thank you very, very much, uh, Marianne. I can see we, oh, uh, I don't think we have um, any more questions at the moment. Um, if you haven't already uh, registered everybody, if you'd like to, um, if you visit our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk, you'll find information there on how to register for tomorrow's uh, webinar. In part two, we'll be hearing from uh, Marianne, who's going to talk more about her research and uh, eyesight, particularly in relation to dementia. Uh, I'd also encourage everybody to register on our website as well, where you'll get regular updates and news from our website every Friday. Um, this includes funding opportunities, events, uh, our details on our podcasts as well and uh, more uh, webinars that we've got lined up over the coming week. Uh, after um, Mariam presents tomorrow, then next Monday we have Dr. Holly Walton talking about her work on evaluating uh, dementia interventions. So thank you very much, um, Marianne. I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And thank you very much, everybody that's participated and joined in today. And thank you to NIHR Dementia Researcher for hosting us. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.